This is the Living History Podcast, broadcasting live across the airwaves. Hello everyone, thank you for joining me on Living History and I hope you enjoyed the recent podcast we did on Gallipoli. This is part two of our two-part special about how to visit the battlefields of Gallipoli. So if you haven't checked out the previous episode, please do because that was all about the logistics of visiting the battlefield, how to get there, where to stay, what to see. And today I want to add to that by talking to a dear friend of mine, Mr. Peter Hart. You would have heard his podcast that he's done previously with us, both of which were uh, fantastic. So go back and check those out as well. Um, But Peter knows Gallipoli just about better than anyone else. He's been visiting there for a very long time. And I'm just really excited to get his input about how to visit Gallipoli and what he finds are the most exciting aspects of a visit to Gallipoli. So Peter, thanks for joining us on Living History. Well, just like visiting Gallipoli, it's an absolute pleasure. (laughs) I really (laughs) like talking on these podcasts. Well, welcome back, mate. The last couple that we did on uh, the interviews with the World War One and World War Two veterans, and also 1918, the uh, the closing stages of 1918, were very popular with our viewers. So I uh, I know that you've certainly got a, va- a fan base with the Living History crowd. So I'm thought this I I'm, I'm sure this will be another one of those popular podcasts. Hope so. Hope so. So uh, wh- let's kick off, Peter. Tell us about your relationship with Gallipoli. You've been going there for a long time, and I know that you love it. What 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 is it about Gallipoli that just draws you in? It, it's so it almost relates back to the, the very first book I ever read about Gallipoli was by a man called Joe Murray, and I read it when I was a strange little child. I read it when I was about fifteen, you know, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, and it was so so exciting, you know, and the Turks and the tunneling and the and everything else and. It, it struck a chord, and then I got, you know, and then I, I interviewed the veterans in the uh, early 80s. I was put on interviewing Gallipoli veterans by the War Museum, and I actually interviewed Joe Murray, and, I, and he was amazing. He did 21 hours, and, and that was great. And, and then I got the opportunity to actually go to Gallipoli in, in 2000 with a, a trip organised by the Australian War, War Memorial and the Imperial War Museum, where I work. And I couldn't believe... How how much it was like, I always wanted it to be. It it it's just for me the perfect battlefield. It's got everything. It 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 it's beautiful. It it's haunting. It, it's the trenches are still there. Some of the big guns are still there. The stories that you can that, that almost still hang in the air. You know the 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 the, 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 the horror that that's under the surface at times. Uh, the sadness of the graveyards. Um, and it, 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 it was just an amazing place to visit. And I have been incredibly fortunate because I've been allowed to visit with various touring companies. I've been an army guide. I've been lots of times and I'm still learning. And I know, Matt, that you're still learning every time you go. You, there's more to learn because you can never know Gallipoli. You can only touch the surface and there's still loads more to learn. There is something special about it, isn't there? There's something there's, for me every time I go there, Pete. It's 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 almost a spiritual thing. There's some incredible connection that I only get at Gallipoli, and I don't want this to sound wanky. You know, people say these sorts of things, but I genuinely believe this. When you go to the Western Front or other battlefields, you can walk the battlefields and get a feeling for what went on. But there's something, as you say, that hangs in the air at Gallipoli. It's palpable. When you're there, you do feel incredibly connected to that history, like you do on no other battlefield. Absolutely. And and part of it is you go to the Western Front and it's all change. Um, all right. So there's exceptions. There's things like Verdun. There, there, are, there are exceptions. But for the most part, especially the British and Australian battlefields, it, it's in your mind's eye. It's not in front of you. At Gallipoli, the hills are still there. The first ridge, the second ridge, uh, Pluggies, they're all still there. And, uh, and, and the trenches are still there. If you walk up Pluggies alongside the path, there's a three foot deep sometimes four foot, sometimes six foot communication trench just to the side. If you walk a bit further, you'll see the gun pits where they used to have the 18-pounders, the, the you know, and the mountain guns, the Indian mountain guns. It's all still there. And I don't know. Yes, well, I, I know we sound a bit obsessed at times, but, but I, I'm always happy to go there, and it, it's an absolute pleasure. In the podcast last week, I spoke about the importance 
from an Australian perspective and a New Zealand perspective of not just visiting the Anzac sector. Talk to us a little bit about that, about the importance of the other theatres apart from just Anzac, and I'm talking here about Helles and Suvla in particular. Talk to us about the importance of those in the overall story of Gallipoli. The thing is that there's no need to denigrate anybody. That's how I start off. So I have the highest respect for the for the Anzac Corps and 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 their achievements uh, at, at Gallipoli. But it is it's only part of the story. Uh, the, the British were the main force, and and they were fighting at Helles. They fought at Anzac. They fought at Suda. They're not to be forgotten. But do you know what? We Brits forget the French. The French had two full divisions there. They had they had more casualties than the Australians and New Zealanders put together. Um, they, 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 there's a very real argument that they, they were the most militarily efficient force there. And to visit their bit of the battlefield, to visit their cemetery, their wonderful, wonderful cemetery with the, the strange to our eyes, Angolian graves, you know, it, it brings it home to you, the French, the level of the French sacrifice. Um and, and and then, look, for instance, one of their great sites, uh, um, uh, the, the quadrilateral, has been cleared in the last year. And you can now see just how riven the ground is by the fighting. You know, it's one of the main killing grounds of the peninsula. It's as, it's as bad as, as, as any Anzac or British site. Uh, so it's, you have to remember uh, it all. T- treat the whole thing as a story. Don't forget anybody. Try and try and take the story in, uh, as a whole, and try and avoid a sort of petty nationalism because it, it it doesn't. It's not a great sound from the British. It's not a great sound from the Aussies, and it's not a great sound, uh, uh, you know, sound from anybody. What we need to do is understand the battlefield and understand the suffering, what went on, why it went on. Uh, and and then just just think about what happened. It's very well said. It's it's very true that the Australians and New Zealanders and the British overlooked the French contribution. But I think the main people who overlooked the French contribution are the French themselves. Have you ever <laughs> spoken to a French person who has heard of Gallipoli or knew that the French lost fifteen thousand men killed on this little corner of Turkey? Absolutely not. But but the, the, for the for the French, the, the main narrative is the Western Front. Uh, what a story that is! I mean, the, you know, they are the real heroes of the Western Front. You know, we Brits and the Aussies like to think we won the war there, but we didn't. The the French did the bulk of the fighting from forty in fourteen, fifteen, in sixteen, uh, seventeen. It draws level, and eighteen, everybody's contributing equally. Um, but. For them, Gallipoli is a sideshow, very much a sh- sideshow. They're only really there to keep an eye on the Brits. You know, if we're if we're fiddling about in the, in the in the Middle East, they want to make sure that whatever we're going to get out of it, they get out their share out of it. They always had their eye on Syria, that kind of thing. You know, uh, so they, they they they're not really committed to the campaign. They're committed to their empire. Pete, while we're talking about the the, the, the combatants involved and this shared responsibility for taking on the Turks. Just give me, what's your view about the Gallipoli campaign, the big picture stuff? Should it have happened? Could it have happened in a different way? Could it have ever worked the way that it was planned and the way it was executed? I'm firmly in the what they call the modern historian and military camp. No, no, and no. Uh, it shouldn't have happened. Uh, we would, we, you ha- we, the, the, all the things that were supposed to come out of it were illusory. Uh, the Balkans aren't going to all join us together. They always fight each other. They're still fighting each other at times. Uh, there's no easy way. Of, there's, no, there's no weapons to send the Russians. There's no, there's no sea route to Russia that can be opened because we've got nothing to give them. Well, I mean, we have the shells crisis on the Western Front. It can't be. There's nothing we could do. All it does is give the Turks the opportunity to kill a large number of the allies, uh, which they take because they fight well. Uh, I believe that the ground is impossible. I think the Turks are well led. Their troops are, are good, in some ways better than ours, better trained. Uh, I think the prospects for success are minimal. Um, I think the naval attempt probably had the best chance, and that wasn't I don't think that had much chance of succeeding. Uh, But when you've stood there, you've stood there actually with me and you've looked up at those hills. Uh, You've looked up uh, the the, the less dramatic but equally bad uh, perspective looking up towards Achibaba from from the the, the Hellas beaches. It's a very, very difficult uh, prospect for anybody. Um, And 
unless that 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 it's predicated on the Turks not being very good at fighting. It's predicated on on the casual racism of the day. You know, Johnny Foreigner, you know, British land, you know, show them the bayonet and they'll run. And of course, the Turks aren't like that. Show the Turks a bayonet and they'll come for you. I'm going to put you on the spot now, Peter. Give us a suggestion for how the Gallipoli campaign could have been done differently and more successfully. How could could the Allies have actually won that campaign in 1915? I do not believe the Allies could have won the campaign in 1915, whatever they'd done. The Turks always had huge amount of resources in hand. Uh, we couldn't get there. Our ships would have run out of ammunition long before. The only way would have been to wait and to launch a proper assault on the uh, the straits, uh, in you know, with proper uh, mine sweeping destroyers, uh, uh, an up-to-date modern force, possibly with uh, landing teams using modern, you know, techniques which didn't exist. So I'm talking rubbish. Um, no, I'm. <laughs> I, I I I I struggle to see how even in 1918 we'd have been successful, if you see what I mean. But one point I would make. And this is to people who, who continually forget the end result of the campaign. The end result of the campaign is that in November 1918, after the Turks had surrendered, we landed at V Beach in, in Hellas again. We took everything. We took Third Ridge. We took, uh, China, we took every objective, every ridge. We took uh, all the hinterland and we took Con uh, Constantinople, Istanbul now. Uh, because in the end... We won the war by defeating the main enemy on the main front. And it's worth remembering that. And, and you know, we may have lost the, the – uh, this is not uh, braggadocio boasting. I'm just saying this is what – it's nothing to do with me. I'm not, not involved. What this is is, is fact. The, the end result for the Turks, as, uh, as uh, Ataturk said, was no nation had ever been more defeated. You know, it, it, it was a terrible series of defeats for them. Uh, and their, their sponsor, so to speak, the, 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 the defeat of Germany meant that they were doomed. It's a really good point. And we, you know, we get confused about that sometimes. And it is the perfect example of we lost the battle, but we won the war. And the effects on Turkey, you know, Turkey was changed forever because of the, uh, the First World War. And I'm sure if had they looked back, they would have played their cards very differently um, with the way they went in the First World War, because it was the end of the Ottoman Empire. The, another thing that comes up quite often is people um, people often have this idea that this was an invasion of Turkey, that we were, you know, that the, I've often heard Gallipoli referred to as, well, when, you know, we, we should feel a little bit morally shamed because we were invading a foreign country. Give me your impression on that, because my, my take on it is that the objectives were fairly limited and confined to territory you know, in and around the Gallipoli Peninsula. How, do you, how does the word invasion sit with you, Pete? I'm, 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 ha I'm, I'm, I'm relatively happy with it in the sense that we did invade. However, it was a legitimate act of war triggered by the Turkish assault on the Russian Navy, you know, uh, who were our allies. I mean, in the childish vernacular of the time, they started it. There was an unfortunate thing where we opened fire on them, on the outer forts, before war had technically been declared but they had you know they were already at war with russia uh, so it's it's a it's a technicality um but 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 it wasn't a mass invasion it wasn't trying to subjugate a country it was trying to achieve a military objective which was to control the straits so that the fleet could get through to the Con to constantinople istanbul and threaten the turkish government and hopefully trigger a surrender there's an awful lot in ifs and buts and and you know it <laughs> It's a very optimistic campaign scenario. I certainly agree. And I, I think we're coloured a little bit. The word invasion is coloured quite a lot by what happened in the Second World War. Like so much to do with the First World War, we look at it through this lens of what happened in the Second World War. And when we say the word invasion, in the context of the Second World War, we're talking about Nazis, you know, con conquering all of Western Europe. So um, I think certainly in, those, uh, in, in, in that context, what we were doing in Gallipoli is very, very different. Absolutely. I mean, our, our objectives, we may have wanted to control the Straits for a while. Uh, I think if you want to talk imperialist, I think we more had our eye on Iraq and Iran. Uh, that's where our imperialistic, uh, you know, that's where, where we wanted things. Um, that, that was our uh, objective. Uh, but, that, but those in themselves were sort of, if not colonies, then detached areas of, of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, 
it, it all gets very complicated. <laughs> I think that you've summed it up perfectly there. This is complicated. I'd say to anyone listening, don't limit your knowledge of uh, of the Gallipoli campaign to a podcast, no matter how much we enjoy talking about it, Pete, or one or two books, because it is uh, it is a thoroughly complicated. There's just so many layers to everything that went on at Gallipoli. Pete, you mentioned at the top of the interview, you mentioned that you spoke to Joe Murray, who was a veteran and you know quite a quite an articulate and 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 wonderful man from everything I've read about him. How much did speaking to all of those veterans influence your opinions about the campaign and and your desire to walk the ground at Gallipoli? They, they were absolutely central to it. Uh, and and if you listen to the detail in Murray's interview or Murray's book. Uh, you you can you could trace where he was on the ground, and one of the great things was I went to uh, Gully Ravine Beach, and there was the and I know you've seen this, and there was the uh, the well that Murray describes digging in 1915. Wow, you know that's quite special, uh, and and you can go and look at the trenches. The the trenches are marked. I, I discovered this recently because as I said, we discover things all the time. And where they, they jumped off on the 4th of June, the, tre- the field shapes, the boundaries of the field are the trenches from 1915. And so you can go and stand where Murray uh, left the trenches on that 4th of June. And all the stories he told going across no man's land, being hit, uh, bullets hitting his, uh, setting off his, uh, his cartridge cases, uh, waking up, uh, seeing uh, seeing the retreat begin, uh, not realizing that the Turks were behind him, jumping across, sort of going back to the front line, the Turkish front line, from you know, finding the Turks were in it and jumping over. And my favourite quote was, uh, "Oh, they jabbed the bayonet right in the nick, right in the nick." <laughs> <laughs> When you're there and you just, I mean, I just, I'm not sentimental particularly, but you just stand in that field and so much else happened there. That is the same field where the 52nd Division attacked uh, a month later. And uh, I, I, I've got some good friends who came over me and they kicked a rugby ball. They were that, the Hoyek Rugby Club and they kicked their ball to symbolise it on the, on the 100th anniversary on the 12th of July. And what a moment that was. It was a rubbish kick as well because it was actually filmed. And the only way they could make it look good was to slow it down. It just shows you these uh, centenary things don't all go, always go entirely to plan. I wonder what the Turkish farmer thought when he found the rugby ball in his field. Well, that's a great question. Now that you bring that up, what do the Turkish people <laughs> think of all these eccentric poms and Aussies and Kiwis tramping all over their fields? Well, I'll tell you something, and I know I know you agree. You say I know... I know a fair bit about Gallipoli uh, on the ground, uh, along with several other British guides that, uh, like Stephen Chambers and other people who are really knowledgeable, you know. Uh, but I, I bow to uh, the Turkish guides, that uh, the local Turkish guides, Bulent Yorgmos, and, and the most famous to the Australians is Kenan Celik. Uh, Kenan Celik taught me a lot of what I know on the ground, uh, in, in talking to me, taking me through, you know, and uh, wow. Their enthusiasm, but also their friendly attitude, their, their complete lack of any uh, residual hatred. And that's why when you see that reconciliation message from Ataturk, now people can argue whether it's Ataturk or Ataturk's secretary who wrote it. I find that. I mean, a politician is always responsible for what goes out in his name. Uh, it doesn't matter who actually wrote it. Do you see what I mean? Absolutely. The reconciliation message, which, uh, is, you know, is basically that uh, our soldiers and their soldiers lie side by side, that they're united and they're now under their care, that kind of thing. I, I can't quote it because I can't quote anything. But wow, what a message. And, and, and the modern Turks bring that to life by their friendly attitude, their willingness to help, their explanations. When people talk about machine guns here, machine guns there, they patiently take you through the army records and show you, you know, what they had and what they didn't have. And we can argue about it, and everyone's entitled to a point of view. But wow, what an input the Turks have to the history. And uh, Kenan Celik is outstanding. Bulent Yorkmus, uh, great guide. He, he was uh, Peter Jackson, the, uh, you know, the uh, New Zealand filmmaker's guide, um, and took him around the battlefield. He said he, said he disappeared. You know those, the, the holes on, uh, at the top of uh, Road Denham Ridge where, where a, 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 a tunnel collapsed, you can get in it. Peter Jackson, this multi-billionaire filmmaker, disappeared into this these holes, leaving saying to Bullet, "Stay there, stay there." <laughs> he went, 
And Blend, you know, an hour later, Blend's going, what do I do? He's billions. Oh, my God, he's lost. I'm going to I'm going to get slaughtered because, of course, you shouldn't really go in these things. And I'm I'm t- I will tell people now I have never been in because I consider it to be dangerous and I don't allow my people to go in. But if you're just guiding Peter Jackson, he wants to go in. He can go in, can't he? <laughs> and you know what I mean? We wouldn't let our people go in uh, because that's just dangerous. But wow, what a toil he had of 60, 60 feet and down a 10 foot drop and dividing and, you know, but me and you would have been scared of the spiders and snakes. <laughs> Peter Jackson's obviously made of, uh, of harder stuff than us. When you mention the Turks and how welcoming they are, I mean, that's the universal thing that people will find. When you go to Turkey, the, the Turkish people are lovely and they are very welcoming of Australians, New Zealanders, Poms, the French people, that, the very few French people that come. And I just imagine the, imagine the French, for example, welcoming the Germans in such a way. Imagine, you know, we this week in Australia, we had the anniversary of the bombing of Darwin. Can you imagine that the Australians would welcome the Japanese to come back and hold memorial services commemorating only their airmen, not even mentioning the Australians that were killed, but only mentioning their airmen who were shot down and killed during the bombing of Darwin? It just wouldn't happen. So it's it's wonderful the way the Turks receive these crazy international visitors. And I, what I most like is often when I, I see that you, you go to some places and there's a sort of obsequiousness and they're clearly only after your money. That is not the case in Turkey. There is a genuine interest in in, a, in our, our shared history. That, that there's a there's a pride in the shared history because they did win, and it's it's helped by the fact that they won the campaign. They lost the war, but they won the campaign. They also performed brilliantly. And for me, as you know, I think the story of the landings is a tale of outstanding heroism by the British, the Australians, and New Zealanders. But it's a, a tale of outstanding heroism and military competence by the Turks. You know, <laughs> they, they fundamentally they win on the first day. Is you know they they do brilliantly. And um, and as I say, people like Kenan and Bulent, they're they're, they're personal friends. And uh, if they ever hear them, uh, I mean, the, the words that most stu- we joke a lot: stupid Bulent, stupid Peter. And he would laugh if he could hear this. But, you know, we laugh at each other and some things he knows and some things I know. But that's the way to go on a battlefield. I know you have your relationship with the guides you've been that must mirror this. Absolutely. And it is one of the highlights of going to Gallipoli is the the friendships that are formed. And everyone is the same. And when you stand, as you say, in front of that memorial to Ataturk with those words, which he may or may not have written, but those words attributed to Ataturk, um, it, it, it does sum up that relationship between Turkey and Australia and Britain and the other countries involved. It's just a wonderful a wonderful place to visit and a wonderful shared history at Gallipoli these days. But it's the only way forward. Reconciliation is the only way forward. Or we all fight each other for the rest of time. You know, um, I think it's great. Pete, do this for us. Tell us, take the three main sectors, so we're talking Anzac, Helles and Suvla, break them down and tell us what are your favourite places in those three sectors what are the three what are the places in those sectors that really speak to you every time you go to gallipoli well i'll, I'll do two from anzac because i i thought i thought you might ask something like this for me one of the highlight walks and this is not on a main tour this is on a, a walking tour um is the walk from uh, shrapnel valley uh and then up onto browns hill uh and up through uh fourth australian uh, parade ground and then up onto uh, Second Ridge. Uh, why do I like that walk so much? Firstly, you're, you're right at the centre of Anzac. As you walk up there, you can't walk up but unless they've cleared it, which I don't think they have. You can't really walk into Shrapnel Valley and Monash Valley anymore. The, the scrub's too bad. It's very difficult to get out of. But if you walk up Bronze Hill, it, it's a lovely walk because you can see everything in, uh, in Shrapnel Valley. Uh, Monash Valley, and and even the other side, Bolton's, uh, whatever it is. Uh, but <laughs> sorry. Um, it's it's just great, and you could see you could see where uh, Bridges was shot. You could see where Simpson was shot. You could see the back of uh, Quinns, the back of of, of uh, the the other posts, Courtney's. You know, it, you could see you can look across and you see Popes. You can see the neck because if you haven't been, it's amazing how small it is. You know, it's but it's it's beautiful. It's 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 historic. And the walk up Bronze Ridge gives you it all. 
And that for me is that that for me is the best walk that anyone can do. It's perfectly safe. It's a great walk. Uh, the, 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 there is another walk for the Australians down Walker's Ridge, but uh, the Australians might consider that to be dangerous. Uh, we British don't, but it's it's a matter of opinion uh, uh, and stupidity, and I've always been fairly daft. Uh, the, the 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 New Zealanders walk for me, and I believe you're doing this uh, in in, a, in but next month is down Rhododendron Ridge, and that is so so. Again, you see all of Anzac across one side, but you also have the whole New Ze- the story of the New Zealander advance, which of course underpins the neck. Uh, the great drama of the neck, because uh, the, the, it's the, the, the it's not British failing; it's the New Zealanders failing to get, and quite reasonably failing, but failing to get to the uh, the top to Chunuk Bay here, and then back down behind the Turkish positions on the neck that uh, causes the disaster at the neck. Uh, now, as you walk down that ridge, you can see why the New Zealanders failed. Uh, you can also see the tunnel I mentioned, which is fantastically interesting. Okay, now, uh, but on the sides of the ridge, especially as you go down, I always go down because I'm 64. <laughs> and, and and if you go up a hill, this is a, a general tip for anyone visiting a battlefield. You walk up the hill, all you see is the backside of the person in front of you. If you walk down the hill, you see the view. And, and if you think about it, that's the way to go. It's also easier, but harder on the knees. But so if you go down and you pass these amazing places, that there's a, you could see the table where the, there's a, the famous recreated photo of the, I think it's the Otago, Otago Rifles, you know, climbing up the side. You can actually see it's the same place. The views are spectacular. The walk is unbelievable. It's only about four miles, so it's easy enough if you're going down. Uh, it's safe these days because they've uh, they've sorted the path out, and it's great. If you're wild, you can go uh, you can go <laughs> you can go down Cheshire Ridge to Little Tabletop, but that's not safe, and that perhaps we shouldn't mention that. <laughs> But that's the point. There's things to do. Uh, and you are going to love that walk. And once you've done it, you will do it every time you go to Gallipoli. I'll tell you now. Yeah, it's one of my great um, the, one of my great oversights is that I've never actually done the walk down Rhododendron Ridge. I've I've talked a lot about it. I mentioned in my book. I send people down there, but I've never actually done it myself. So uh, I'm looking forward to doing that, and um, and it's going to be good. I'm, I'm I'm as you say, I'm heading to uh, Gallipoli for over the Anzac period for the first time since 2015. So I'm looking forward to um, I've and uniquely I've got some time to myself. So I'm looking forward to doing a bit of exploring and getting off the beaten path and. Which you can always do at Gallipoli. It's just it's just designed for exploration. Talk to me about the other sectors as well. What what do you like to see in Hellas? Hellas, uh, I I think uh, uh, if I've only got one well, W Beach is the best. Most they've spoiled Sedel Bar Castle. I'm afraid they've rebuilt it as a 15th century castle, uh, as a sort of fairy tale castle, which spoils it a bit. V Beach is obviously wonderful, and the stories and the spit still there, great. Uh, w Beach has it's like an infrastructure, and it actually has. You could see the cave where they're packed full of explosives and then blew up on the day they evacuated, uh, the 8th, 9th of January. And you could see how it's blown the cave out. And you then, if you look round, you see you're in an explosion field. And you know what, Matt? Did I notice that? Did I? buggery i didn't notice it because i'm a civilian who noticed it was a chap who'd been serving in afghanistan and he said why why are we in a debris field and then suddenly i pieced the story together but my favorite site at the moment is the walk up uh, uh, gully ravine uh, another walk i'd urge you to do which which a lot of australians don't do but one of the reasons for that and this is a bit niche is that one of my friends uh, i call it derek's dump made a mind called derek and he discovered on our day off uh, a, a, a cache of tins. I'll, if, if you have a, a website to go with these things, I'll send you the photo. And it, the tins from 1915 had somehow come on the surface of this hollow. And you could see the McConaughey tins. You could see the bully beef tins. You could see, you know, they're just on the surface. And one of the lads picked up a bully beef tin. I wouldn't. I don't allow people to touch it now. And I won't say exactly where it is. I'll tell you, but I won't tell you on the thing. Um, uh, and it still had not meat, but stuff in it, <laughs> and it smelled horrible. And it's amazing, and it brings it home. Real people used to eat here. It, it was clearly a kitchen area, and and I know where it is. It's behind where uh, some guns were. 
But wow, and 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 the Gully Ravine, it's got everything. It's got Joe Murray's uh, well at the end. It's got cliffs. It's got it's got uh, the the redoubts where the troops went over the top with machine guns pointing them in a V-shaped valley, hundred feet high on either side. And what a story! Uh, so that for me is uh, is Hellas. Uh, and well, just before we move on from Hellas, Pete, can you tell us a little bit more about Gully Ridge because it or Gully Ravine? Because Gully Ravine um, would not be familiar to Australian listeners of the podcast, but it's such a, an amazing place, as you've spelled out, it's such an amazing place to visit at Hellas. Give us a little bit of the backstory about why it's so important. Well, it's so important because, uh, the, uh, as you know, the uh, the Turkish observation and guns from up on Achi Baba and, and the, the, you know, the ridges were such a, almost every... When you stand up there, they've got a stupid viewing platform, which I don't like, but it's there. Uh, the, the secret about Achi Baba is it's a fake. You can see the whole of the peninsula, but you can't see the narrows. So even if you capture it, you've still got three or four more. You've got to catch a place called Kilid Bahir, uh, which is even worse across from more valleys. But the point about it is you can't see inside Gully Ravine. So Gully Ravine became because it's too deep. It's too deep and narrow and dramatic, so you can't see in it from even not even from up on the on the Achibaba. So therefore, it was like a gigantic communication trench, and therefore it's full of stuff. I mean, it's just full of stuff. I mean, I, I've seen uh, people. I don't take things away, and I encourage people not to. But I, I you know, we've, besides this cache of tins, uh, we found uh, the blue water bottles. We found the grenades. We found. Be careful with them. There's not many of those left about them. Uh, but for me, for me, it's the redoubt B and C. And these redoubts and Frith Trench and the redoubts are like they look like they're concrete sort of shelves. The story. I mean, you can laugh and joke. I'm, I'm from. I think you could enjoy a battlefield, but when you've enjoyed it and had a good laugh and soaked your mates, then you look and ahead of you you can see. I get B and C mixed up. You, you're at C. You can look forward to B. It's about 80 yards away, and then you imagine taking the trees out. And it's just a bare gully, and that's where the 14th Sikhs attacked on the uh, on the 4th of June, and they were slaughtered, absolutely slaughtered. Um, you know, most of the English officers were killed. And most of the men were killed. Um, I think Savory, Reginald Savory was one. He left an account and said, I love their regiment. You know, we built them up and they were killed in five minutes. You know, this is just awful. And um, and then when you go higher that, you start to come through to the Turkish area. And there you get the Turkish hospitals. And, of course, you get on the left, you get uh, the, 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 the British uh, the British front line where it finishes. Um, and, uh, I mean, the field used to be covered with Turkish corpses because the, the Turks launched some really big attacks and uh, they, they used to reckon that it was like a melon field from the skulls lying in the gully and on the fields, a uh, gully ridge. That is gully ridge. Uh, so what a place, what a place, you know, uh, history all around you. Um, you know, great. It is one of the absolute highlights of a visit to Gallipoli is, is Gully Ravine. As I said, virtually unknown to Australians and New Zealanders, but so worth exploring when you're down at uh, at Hellas. Talk to us about Suvla, Pete, the uh, the forgotten cousin of the Gallipoli campaign. I, I, Suvla's beautiful. Um, it's uh, uh, I, it's going to sound like I'm groveling, but I, to Australia's and New Zealand, I do particularly like Hill 60. Uh, funnily enough, because I, I one of the first people I interviewed was Malcolm Hancock. Or was it Michael Hancock? Oh, just bear with me on that. Hancock, anyway. And he was a young machine gun officer and a bombing officer, and the trenches then, because they've grown, overgrown a bit in the last 20 years, they were still there. They're still there, but they're under, overgrown a bit. And you could see where the, where they fought. You could see where that the, the young Australian, I've forgotten his name, begins with T, um, um, the, the chap who, who killed himself. Throstle. Uh, one of the, that's right, sorry, Throstle. Yes. Uh, the, the young lad, he um, killed himself uh, very unfortunately in the 20s. Um, but uh, you could see where he fought, and wow, what a tale that is! People and there's, there's I think it's Sam Cottrell or someone c- catches a, a grenade. The only way they could get grenades by the end was to catch the Turkish ones and and then throw them back. And he mistimed it. And he lost his hand. He was throwing it with just his one, his other hand. Oh, you know, and you you're there. And then if you look in the field in front of you, you could see the the explosion crater, and you could it. The place is covered. With bones, Matt, you've been there. And there's bits of 
teeth, head, uh, skulls, because skull is very identifiable, as you know. It's just the shape of it. Um, the first time I ever went to Gully Ravine, me, myself and Nigel Steele, who I wrote my first book, Defeated Glibly with, we, we were just stopped by the side of the road that leads past the cemetery at Hill 60, and we, we found a whole leg. You know, we, we thought we were just kicking away at the ground, and we found that the bones connected together, the whole leg. And that for... Uh, I was that was quite I I was quite shaken by that at the time I tell you. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's it is one of the things that people should be aware of at Gallipoli is there is a very high probability of coming across um human remains mostly turkish they are because the turks didn't the turks seeing their dead as martyrs didn't bury them in organized cemeteries the way the allies did they tended just to bury them where they lie but what that means is particularly when you get washaways and gullies and after a bit of rain and yeah you know, it, it, there's a fairly high probability of coming across human remains it's a, it's a fair warning for people who walk that ground it's it's not like the western front where they would close the field and and have an investigation i mean I found I found two skulls once. Uh, that was at the back of Quinn's. Uh, you know, uh, I went down to look at the um, uh, where where Malone's terraces were. And he's a great hero of mine. I love him. So bad tempered, <laughs> miserable bugger with a moustache. Bad tempered, typical Scot from New Zealand. So, so if you know what I mean. Um, and um, but uh, we we found two skulls down there. We you find a lot of uh, of the the main thigh bones. And you see skulls, uh, bits of skulls as well. They're recognisable. Um, and uh, basically, treat them with respect. Leave them. If it's if it's a lot of a body, then you, you should report it. But uh, there's no point in reporting individual bones because no, no, nobody's going to do anything. I found during one of the research trips for my book, I was walking on the path... Um down to the Masudier gun from Baby 700 Cemetery. It's just a p- people that go there will walk that path. It's quite commonly walked. Uh, and there was the top of a skull sitting perfectly in the middle of the track that had just been exposed due to recent rain. So that one I did report to the Commonwealth War Graves because I thought it was right in the middle of a main, a fairly main thoroughfare. But as we say, we don't, I don't want this to sound ghoulish in any way, but this is just one of the facts. This is a battlefield. We shouldn't sugarcoat it. A lot of people died in this area and a lot of them still lie there. And if you walk the ground and if, particularly if you get off the beaten track, which you certainly should do when you go to Gallipoli, you're going to come across human remains. And that, that, that brings it home. That's an important part of the story. Well, I, I mean, my attitude is I'm, I'm, I'm not religious, but my, my, my main, I always try every day to go to one of the main cemeteries and, and just have a look around, and just think about the sacrifice of lives. Think about the Turks' sacrifice as well, because their their cemeteries aren't as clear. Although where you're talking about, uh, they've now cleared the ground, and you can see the Turkish cemetery that lay behind that gun. Uh, you'll find that fascinating. Go go and look at it again. Uh, it's changing all the time. You know, um, they've they've cleared the the uh, the south side of uh, of Lone Pine. You know that. That, that was completely overgrown that leads down to the, the sort of five little valleys, all given terrible names like sloth and despond and despair and things that lead down to Pine Ridge and the four next to it that lead down towards Gabba Tepe. They've cleared the top of that now. It, 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 it's And every time they clear something or there's a fire, there's more to see uh, uh, and there's more for, to learn. It, it's so fascinating. Uh, but as I say, every time there's something cleared or there's a fire, the human remains come out, which reminds us that for all the fun you can have on a battlefield, we have to remind, remember why we're really there. Absolutely. Very well said. Well, just before we wrap it up, Pete, what's your, what's your advice for people who are thinking of going to Gallipoli? What, what, what's, the info, what's the advice you can give them after all your experience to, to really help them get the most out of a, a visit? I, I, I'm a firm believer in the, tour, the two-tour system. Uh, I would go on, on a basic tour. Uh, a, a tour that takes you to the main site, introduces you to Gallipoli, and also perhaps puts it in a cultural context by visiting Istanbul. Uh, that would be, you know, a first tour. Uh, I would incline then, if you can, to get back on a walking tour with a a, a reputable uh, local guide, um, and uh, I.e. not a, what we call an Istanbul guide, uh, but a local guide. People people like Belent and, and Kenan. Uh, I'm sorry just to name those two. They're just the ones that are in my mind. Um, uh, and uh, and a, a reputable Australian or British guide or New Zealand, you know, uh, because they will show you the things. But you cannot just wander about at Gallipoli uh, because there are there are it's not dangerous, but it can be dangerous if you if you make a mistake. Uh, it's a bit like crossing the road. 
um, it, it's not dangerous, but if you make a mistake, it can be painful or fatal. And at Gallipoli, it's more likely to be painful. But if you twist an ankle when you're, for instance, we didn't mention at Suvla, Kirich Tepe Ridge is amazing. One of the most beautiful places I've ever been on. Uh, the fighting there was dramatic. But if you twist your ankle on the very stony and difficult ground, you're going. To, you're in for a world of pain. You know, you need to have somebody with a phone, somebody who can speak Turkish, somebody who can look after you. And anyway, you have to have a Turkish guide if there's more than six of you by, by law. Well, Pete, thank you so much. It's been a wonderful insight into what is really a wonderful battlefield to visit. And um, it's it's great to hear your insight into it because I know how much you love walking the ground there. And you're, you're a little bit spoiled being in Europe. You've got access to uh, Gallipoli that I don't have. So I'm looking forward to getting back over there. What? Tell me, what? Just before we finish up, what are you working on now, Pete? What are we going to see from Peter Hart in the coming in the coming months? Uh, I'm afraid it's a second world war. I'm working on a, an artillery group. It's a, it's a, it's a story. I did these interviews with uh, 50 or 60 from the South Knots Hussars, which are 107 medium regiment by the end of the war. Uh, but they fought on 18 pounders, 25 pounders. They were at Tobruk. They were wiped out almost uh, at uh, Knightsbridge. Then they fought their way through El Alamein with 5.5 inch guns through Sicily and then through back to England and then had the pleasure of going through. Uh, through Normandy and through through the European campaign, but the interviews are amazing. The average length ten hours. There and and I, it, it, do you know what? I know you feel this about history. People say it's work, and and yes, sometimes it is bloody work, and sometimes it's it's a pain in the ass. But mostly, I love it, and I am so much enjoying writing this book. And it's Second World War, which is not my main thing but it's just the way that my publishers have directed me you know um i was lucky enough to have a bit of a success with the last two or three books for for the and they want me to do this now and do you know what i'm loving it loving it well we discussed that in our uh, interview about world war one and world war two veterans so everyone should go back and listen to that because you talk in more detail about that unit and how uh you know how important it was to to get all their memories while they were still alive and still coherent and and um, still able to uh, to share those experiences, so everyone should go back and certainly listen to that one. And of course, they should get one of your books. I'm, I'm not I'm not unduly flattering you here when I say you do have a, a wonderful way of bringing this history to life, Pete. And so I would encourage everyone to go out and read books by Peter Hart because they are really quite extraordinary. Well, that's very nice of you. Thank you. <laughs> Mate, thank you for joining us. It's always wonderful. We'll get you back on in the not-too-distant future. And uh, thank you very much for your time. Cheers. Cheers.